Willie D. Live. Right? Did, did anybody go to jail? Not yet, because I'm still working. Okay. But it gets better. So then, at the CARP meeting, um, I don't know if you remember this, they had this, um, this uh, human trafficking facility by the name of The Refuge that was out of Bastrop. And it made a big, big, big national news type deal because supposedly, allegedly, that children were being exploited, taking pictures of them, selling the pictures and all this here type of stuff. And this was supposed to be a provider that Governor Abbott was backing. Okay, so right. when I got a wolf of it, and then that's when I was on. If you go on social media, you'll see me on the Senate floor going off on people. You'll see me exposing everybody. So then we get to the CARP meeting yesterday. Well, before then, I did a press conference in March because it was brought to my attention that Human Health Services gave them a license after their license was taken from them during this investigation process. Now, if that would have been somebody that looked like me or Hispanic, we would not have had the opportunity to get our license back. They'll take it, and that's it. So me, with my messy tail, I went right on over there in Bastrop and had other Democratic officials with me, and we were denouncing this facility, because something happened now. I don't give a damn what you say. Something happened now with them damn children. Because just like how you, I like your word that you always say, the Klan jury. Yeah, they had a Klan jury that said nothing happened. How convenient. Something happened now. So at the end of the day, you didn't close black providers and, bl and brown providers over something minute. Like, like a not having signatures or, you know, a couple of deficiencies that the, they have. The exit, the exit light out. Yes. But then mm. you turn around and you get these sap suckers another chance to get a license. So if you're going to do that for them, you need to do it for everybody else. So when I asked that question at the meeting, licensing human health services, pew, they got on the body there. I ain't know where they went. Because I got some legitimate questions. And if you're not going to answer it, then I'm going to put you on blast again. Because at the end of the day, you're giving a license to a facility where something happened. And that is not protecting kids. And then I wanted to make sure, CPS, you gave them a contract? Because I'm going to come for you too. Because it's our job to protect the unprotected. Now, now, who has the most power, CPS or human resources? I mean, not, well, no, human no, health, services, health services. Okay, so it used to be that CPS and human health services was one entity. And then back in 2015, during that legislative session, they became, CPS became a standalone agency. Yeah. And HHSC only dealt with the regulatory piece, and CPS deals with the contractual piece. OK, now they're in a federal lawsuit with uh, Judge Janice Jack and she she don't hold no punches with them because she asked the same questions I asked. Who gave this provider a license? Everybody over here looking like you had an egg drop on your face, you know, because at the end of the day, our job is to protect kids. You know, this this is not politics. We're supposed to protect kids. And if you run around here not leveling the playing field, see, that's what they don't like about me. I'm going to make sure you're going to level that playing field because if you don't, I'm exposure. I'm going to go public on you. And I, I went public on CPS for about six months straight. I even, and, and, and what ended up happening, CPS was like, hey, Dr. Matthews, we're going to work with you. You know, we we let us know anything that you get so we can get in front of it. We're going to work with you because I exposed a CPS supervisor in Tyler, Texas. This joker had his CPS badge on and got caught in a prostitution sting mm. by the feds. And they were going to try to sweep it under the rug. No, no, there you're not. I'm going to put this right on out here. This is the same joker that's removing kids and making decisions on kids. And you over here in a prostitution thing, and then you got a wife and kids. Where they do that at? So, I mean, 
In this line of work, you have to be steadfast. You have to be no nonsense. And you have to keep the children in mind first. Because if you don't, then you're going to be a boot-licking joker who's going to sit up here and let them handle you any which way but Sunday. Well, some of them keep the, the kids in mind, the children in mind first for special reasons. You know, they want to play with the kids. You know, they want to touch on them and stuff like that. How big of an issue is uh, sexual assault and abuse in the foster care system? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge factor because you know why? It's a huge factor to the fact where when these children become adults, it affects them in their adult life. This is a certain type of trauma that has to be worked through throughout your adult life. A lot of this stuff explains a lot of decision-making that former foster youth makes. Uh, it explains why some of them go into homosexuality, some of them, you know. It explains how um, they leave in one system, go into the prison system. This stuff is like real deal, serious business. And, and it would, happens. And I would assume it has a, a lot of uh, alcohol and drug. Oh, absolutely, to it absolutely. And then let's let's just be clear. They even try to over medicate our kids, bro. They try to over medicate them. You know what I mean? You may have a kid that's probably ADHD, right? Okay, let his ass go run down the street or something. Put him in an activity or something like that. Let him burn the energy off. But then you want to put him on ADHD medicine. You want to put him on depression medicine. You want to put him on mood disorder medicine. Like, come on, man. Like, what you doing? Why you want to over-medicate our kids? Because you got to keep them out. Like I so told them. control them. Like I told them in that meeting. These are our kids. These kids look like us. So how can Becky and Ken make decisions on our children? When you can't even empathize with us. You don't know what it's like to have the police to come in your house and remove you from your family. You don't know what it's like to have actual children sleeping on a mattress with bed bugs and feces because your mom and your dad is strung out on crack. You know what I mean? You don't know what it's like to come from the hood staying in the projects. You don't know nothing about that. So how can you make decisions on our kids. That's why that ethnic makeup of that committee has to have people that look like our kids. Because if not, then it's designed for them to leave the foster care system to the prison system. Yeah, did you sad. know Texas, yeah. um, not to cut you off, did you know Texas has a contract with private prisons? Yeah. Right? Spoke so, on that way back in the early 90s. Okay. So you already know the game ain't changed. Yeah. So if Texas does not fill those beds, then Texas owes the private prisons money. So what system feeds the prison system? Foster care. Yeah. Is foster care uh, more designed to accommodate younger kids or older kids? Both. But see, what's happening at this point right now is that they have this deal that's called CWAP, which is called Child Without Placement, because a lot of these teenagers, a lot of the foster parents can't really handle a lot of these teenagers. So then what happens? They stand in CPS offices with the caseworker or they stand in CWAP, which could be a church or it could be, you know, some type of facility with the caseworkers where they have different shifts. And then they age out and become homeless. Yeah. And then now they do have a program that's called extended foster care. But if the behaviors is not on point, then they don't qualify. And now one thing I can say is when CPS children finish the PALS program, their college is paid for. As long as they're going to a public university or college until they're 65 years old. Paid for. 100%. Mm. When I was a foster parent, that's how come I had a lot of my kids graduate under me. Because of that. Yeah, you going to pass. Yeah, what school we going to? Because uh, we're not about to do this. And then 
that's why I'm so passionate about this because I've actually had children in my home before I even had my own kids graduate under me and I got them through. So that's why I'm such a fighter when it comes to this. And you can't piss on my leg and tell Ms. Rainer because I'm letting you know now I'm going to expose you and it ain't no telling what's going to come out of my mouth. Because I'm so passionate about it. You know, and it's like a lot of people, they really don't know how serious this stuff is. They really don't know. They don't. What's the process for becoming a foster parent and what's the difficulty? Um, the process, first of all, you got your application that you got to fill out. You got to do your background checks. You got to do three background checks. You got to have a DFPS, which is the abuse and neglect background. You got to have the statewide DPS background and then FBI background check, right? So they can make sure you're not messing with kids, whatever state you come from or whatever. Then, of course, you have to have your home has to pass the licensing inspection piece because you have a lot of these homes that um, these kids have to have their own rooms. So you have to have your house to meet the expectations according to the minimum standards, which is the regulation under human health services that we have to follow. Then, of course, foster parents have to Make sure that they have to do the foster parent paperwork with taking notes. If they are on medication, they have to do medication logs. They have to do trainings yearly for that because if they don't, then the provider will get cited, like me, will get cited as a deficiency. And so once they become licensed, you know, you got to go through a home study process. They're going to ask you all type of questions, going to try to get all in your business. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That's what we want because we also look at your... Uh, your financial income. What is it that you're making? You know what I mean? Because you're not going to use this as a come up. That's what you're not about to do. You know, so it's different uh, factors that we deal with with becoming a foster parent. But once you become a foster parent, um, your house will be under scrutiny because one, one of these kids, I'm, I'm being real with you. One of these kids can sit up here and lie on you because you didn't want to let them go somewhere. They're going investigation. And if you had a boot licking agency or if you had one of them white supremacist type agencies, they're going to throw you on the bus and take your license and that kid going to go to a whole nother house. And you can't be and operate or nothing with kids, especially, let's say, if you are a certified teacher or a counselor or anything that have a professional license that deal with kids. If you get an investigation and that investigation comes back as a reason to believe or they feel that you've done something, that's like a felony in the child welfare world, which means you're going to lose your license. You're not going to be able to operate around children, period. That's why it is very vital that you are at a agency or with a provider who is going to fight for you. A provider who they scared of, one, and a provider who they respect, and then a provider who has not just activism influence, but political, when you have to let it out. But, again, you have a lot of these false parents want to go over there to Becky and Ken now and think everything going to be fine until you get in trouble. Don't call me when you get in trouble. I'm mm -hmm. trying to save you now. 